Well, the organization representing Canada's farm families was on Parliament Hill today to talk about the challenges facing Canada's farmers and the need for increased government support. The Canadian Federation of Agriculture is promising to make agriculture a key issue in the upcoming election campaign to make sure that the concerns of farm families are addressed with a campaign called Producing Prosperity for Canada. Mary Robinson is the president of the Canadian Federation of Agriculture. She's a Prince Edward Island farmer, and Keith Curry is an Ontario farmer and the vice president of the CFA. Good to see you both. Thanks for being here to talk about this. Uh, Mary Robinson, let me start with you. How, how can uh, the, the pitch today was, look, Canadians, the agri-food industry can actually drive economic prosperity in this country. How so? Well, we know that in 2016, uh, agriculture was uh, $112 billion is what we contributed to GDP. Uh, and we know that we have all kinds of untapped potential. So we're rolling out the Producing Prosperity campaign in hopes of educating both our politicians as well as citizens who don't live near farms, but 80% of our population lives in urban centers. Uh, so we're, we're hoping to uh, have people understand better what agriculture can bring to the economy if we we truly have leadership and investment in it. Okay, let's come back to some of that. But Keith, let me, let me ask you, this sounds a bit like uh, what Ontario farmers were doing in the Ontario Provincial Campaign last time around. Do you, do you think it had an effect and, and do you hope to, to, to bring that to an international, uh, or sorry, national audience across the country? A absolutely, Peter. It's very much like the campaign we, we rolled out in Ontario. Rural Canada is the same no matter where you go as far as uh, the aspects of economic growth and food security, environmental uh, stewardship. So we uh, at CFA, we decided to model our campaign much like Ontario's was. Uh, we ha are starting to see some, uh, some success in Ontario. Uh, the government of the day is talking prosperity and a lot of things that they're doing. Uh, it's not a short-term plan, it's a long-term campaign. We want to kick it off during the federal election here nationally, but we're continuing to push on both levels, federally and provincial, provincially, to make sure it's a long-term campaign. So specifically, what do you want from the federal government? How does the federal government make the Producing Prosperity campaign a success? What's their role in making this happen? Well, we are hoping to have better interdepartmental work within government. Uh, agriculture is impacted by so many different ministers uh, and we, we want to see better collaboration, whether it's trade or health and PMRA or uh, immigration and employment with regard to access to foreign workers. We, we need to see better collaboration um, and we're hoping that uh, through this communication, we'll, we'll build more awareness and uh, have better uh, teamwork. It's, it sounds like the suggestion is that the way the government's operating now, it's, it's actually holding you back. Is that mm -hmm. is, what, are, what are the problems when you talk about this better intergovernmental cooperation? What what are the consequences of of that poor cooperation? If that's what it is, Keith. I mean, what, what are you seeing? What, what's holding you back? Well, we're always asking the government to take a. a, a agricultural look on anything they do, any ministry that, that we're involved with. And we don't just deal with the Ministry uh, of Agriculture, we deal with infrastructure, we deal with natural resources, right. uh, environment, labor, finance, they're all combined. And sometimes they don't talk to those of us on the ground, i.e. agriculture, as to how what they're doing impacts us. And you really need to take a holistic look at what agriculture is and what they can provide because when you do something on this side, it might affect something on that side. So as Mary mentioned, as long as the ministries are talking to each other and making sure that they're understanding how we get impacted on the ground, that's going to benefit us all. It was pointed out today at the news conference you had that government support programs, I guess, for agriculture in Canada dropped by almost half in the, in the past 15 years, or half, 5.4 billion in 2004 to 2.7 billion now. Uh, what does that say? Why is that happening? So uh, we have a business risk management suite of programs that were initially put in place to help uh, agricultural producers uh, be buffered through uh, poor situations, mm -hmm. whether it's weather or if it's uh, the impact of non-tariff trade barriers or, or what, it, what it may be. Uh, and uh, a handful of years ago, uh, the guidelines of that, the the uh, allowable expenses were changed and also the the amount uh, that would be eligible to be paid out to producers that's all changed which has really made the programs ineffective now they're more a catastrophic program than they are meant uh, initially they were meant to be you know leveling out mm -hmm. the playing field so that we'd be better buffered and we wouldn't uh, be exposed to all the volatility that we could continue to make investments in our businesses and yet if you look at the numbers here I mean I think you pointed out today the agri-food industry is enjoying double-digit economic growth, 11%. Mm. So, uh, what is it, if there's been a decline in in sort of government supports, it doesn't seem to have held the industry back. I mean, you seem to be still 
growing faster than many other sectors of the economy. We've been very fortunate that we haven't had that situation where it's been, had a dramatic effect. Uh, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're moving into a situation with our canola in this in this country where potentially that could that could really affect people, uh, especially in Western Canada. And this is a case where a, a business risk management program really is an insurance program against things that are out of our control, like like trade tariffs, like Mother Nature and affecting us with the weather, as Mary uh, alluded to. So, you know, we need that backstop in place. Uh, one that works so that when these kind of situations come up, our farmers aren't at risk of losing their businesses. Right. Is it harder to be a farmer in this country these days than it was a decade ago? There certainly is quite a burden with regard to uh, red tape. Uh, if you speak with most farmers, they'll, they'll uh, reference how many different uh, uh, papers need to be filled out in order to do what they're doing. The, the bar has been raised on rules and regulations and it seems that we uh, we are at a competitive disadvantage more often than we'd be happy to be. What's your view, Keith? Well, I agree with Mary and, and, and to add to that, we're dealing with uh, public trust issues, public perception of what we do and uh, certainly the mental health has played, a, mental health issues have played a really big key role in, in what's going on on the farm. We know that in agriculture our numbers are quite a bit higher than the average of society. So we're dealing with that stress level all the time, whether it's Mother Nature as I mentioned earlier, or people in society that just don't understand how we do what we do and are asking a lot of questions or even pushing back and saying we don't like that. Not necessarily having a full basis of, of foundation as why they Give have an example. That where, where are you seeing this kind of pushback? Animal activists are a big one. Uh, they're pushing back on animal husbandry, for example. We have national codes of practice for husbandry, and they, they were put together by a, a whole team of, of, of both scientists, academia, and farmers. What's in the best interest of the animal today with the technology and, and techniques we have? And people still don't think that we're doing a good enough job, and they're pushing back for, through activism. And that puts a lot of stress. We've had a couple a real big instance in Ontario in the last few weeks and it, it puts a lot of stress on farmers knowing that people can just trespass on their property for example and, and interfere with their day-to-day -day businesses. And so what what's the solution to that? Is that a, another is that a call on government? Uh, I think it's a call on everyone. Uh, you know, we need to do a better job of having the conversation with the public, uh, and just inform them what it is we do. And and not we're not trying to hide anything. We just probably haven't had the had the right way to have that conversation in the past. But we're learning uh, how to do that. Mary belongs to a, a national public trust steering committee that's you know looking for ways that we can start interacting with the, with the general public, making them a part of of what we do. You know, we welcome their input. What is it you want from us? We will we will do our best to accommodate that. Okay, a couple things to finish on. Um, uh, I want to come back to Keith on, on, on the carbon tax issue because it might have particular reference to Ontario. But So the, the message to, to the politicians you're talking to today is, is what with the election campaign coming up? What's, boil it down for me. What is, what is it you want from them? With our three pillars that we've outlined in our, in our Producing Prosperity campaign, we're looking for leadership and investment in those three pillars. So economic development, uh, food, security mm -hmm. and environmental stewardship. Agriculture is perfectly positioned to really grow our economy and we just need uh, support of government to get there. Let me come back to you on the carbon tax. Uh, you have it in Ontario now and I'm wondering what that means for farmers in, in this province. Other farmers have been dealing with it in other jurisdictions in the country but anybody dealing with in the four provinces now dealing with the federal backstop, uh, what's it going to mean? Well, certainly right off the bat, we're going to notice those provinces that are using the federal backstop, we're, we're noticing you know, a, a sudden increase in fuel prices, farm fuel prices. Uh, the government has come forward and given a, an exemption for diesel and gasoline on farm right. that's delivered on farm. Uh, they've given a partial exemption uh, for greenhouses using natural gas or propane, but we're seeking an exemption for all farm fuels. And the reason why we're doing that is not that we don't want to do our part uh, as part of society, but as farmers, <clears throat> we don't have the option to uh, increase the cost of our product going at the end of the laneway. Well, our markets are set by world prices or, or by Chicago Board of Trade, depending on you know what you're marketing, and we can't change those. You can't prices. pass it on. We can't pass mm -hmm. it on. We can't add a, a nickel to every product going out the door. So we have to absorb that cost. And when you factor in all the services that are provided to us, vets, fuel delivery, fertilizer delivery, custom applications they're all charging a surcharge on top of that. So we're bearing these costs without any way to get out from underneath it. 
And, and that, that immediately becomes problematic. We've also done a very good job over the years of, of quite frankly, we grow, we grow plants, so we sequester carbon. So we're asking the government, government to consider the economic or the environmental benefits that we're providing, not only for carbon sequestration, but for all the, all the other uh, environmental aspects, and give us some consideration and some initiatives to continue to do that to help offset maybe some, some carbon pricing. All right, good to talk to you both. Uh, thanks for coming in. Thank you.